is the co-chair of the MFA Designer as Author program and the author of over 100 books. This is one of his lectures in the Paul Rand Lecture Series. Hi, my name is Steve Heller and I am not a design historian, nor do I play one on TV. I've always wanted to say that. This is about designing graphic design history and it'll be personal perspectives in the age of attention deficit disorder. I may not be a design historian, but I am a designer with a particular interest in history, and specifically design history. I'm fascinated by the everyday objects that we as individuals and a culture uh, touch our lives in one way or another. I've devoted the better part of my professional life to exploring, analyzing, documenting, and writing about graphics that shape our lives or some part of it. It started long before I joined the field, even before I was thrown out of art school. As a kid, I collected things. I still have boxes of US astronaut ephemera from the Mercury and Apollo space programs. I would write letters every week requesting photos, pamphlets, anything the press office could spare. But don't worry, this talk is not about my adolescent obsessions. It is about how I became historically motivated and developed into a chronicler of design history. First of all, I was influenced by pop culture, at least what was current in the 1960s. Let's look at some of the artifacts I saved from that time. Sgt. Pepper was as important to me for the Peter Blake cover as for the Beatles' incredible music. I learned about media through Quentin Fiore's design. It was this book that made me think about becoming a designer. Magazines were the museums of the street, and the 60s provided a wide variety. Magazines were also my entree into the realm of political graphics. My favorite caricaturist was David Levine. I savored copies of the New York Review of Books with his work in it. But it was Evergreen Review, where years later I was briefly art director, that introduced me to radical art, particularly the work of George Gross. Herb Lubalin's design for avant-garde was revolutionary, and I modeled my own typographic style on his, although you'd never know it. And the intersection of real life and design had a marked impact, particularly the sexual revolution. I was a fan of Playboy, but it wasn't until I found Eros that I realized the power of design to transcend the tawdrier cliches of sex. I was lucky to be born into the 60s youth culture generation, not just as a consumer, but as a producer. I worked on the East Village Other as a designer, and I was the art director for the New York Free Press and Screw. This is the first and rather inelegant issue I designed of Screw, but I was only 17. I was even co-publisher of this political satire magazine, Mobster Times. Being part of history made me want to study more of history. In 1974, I became the art director of the New York Times op-ed page. It triggered in me a passion for political art and discovering more about the history of illustration and what I called graphic commentary. From the op-ed page, I took over the book review section, where I began to use illustrators who were, for me, the building blocks of history, like this one by Edward Gorey. Being a Times art director gave me access to various archives and libraries. I recall finding one cache of WPA posters, which changed my entire perspective about art and design. The primary way I learned history lessons back then was to hire illustrators who captured the essence of the past in their work. This by Richard McGuire was based on a vintage tuberculosis poster. And this, well, I don't have to tell you what this is from. Ed Lamb did the painting. I was also allowed an opportunity to experiment with the format of the publication and make my own history, so to speak. In this case, I assigned Ed Fella to alter our cover, replacing the conventional masthead with his own lettering. And in this, Chris Ware, one of today's most accomplished and prolific comic artists and graphic novelists, went even one step further. He changed the New York Times masthead to the one that was used in the 1920s. I was told I could never do that again. 
Speaking of comics, Art Spiegelman, who had done comics for me on the op-ed page, did this cover. And speaking of history, what is more iconic than Milton Glaser's Dylan, updated as an illustration for Dylan's Chronicles? Working with artists, designers, and illustrators who are key to design history added to my own sense of legacy. This cover is by psychedelic pioneer Victor Moscoso. And for those of you who know of my interest in totalitarian regimes and the graphics used to brand them, these covers by Stephen Brodner, caricatures of leading communist leaders, had great resonance for me. Whether these or any of the preceding work will make it into future histories is yet to be seen, but they are examples of the practitioner as student of history. Now I'll talk about the practitioner as chronicler and scholar of history. For me, the study of design history began with early held interests. Owing to the fact that a portion of my family perished during the Holocaust, I'm interested in how acts so heinous could occur. As a designer, I cannot be blind to the impact of graphics on the propagation of the Nazi faith. Of course, these brought me to the swastika as the preeminent symbol of the crimes, and an intellectual and emotional need to trace its origins from the source to the 12-year Nazi regime. I wrote a book, The Swastika, A Symbol Beyond Redemption, to explore the complex narrative of the symbol and develop what I call a critical history. Rather than being an exhaustive scholarly inquiry, it is a question about the symbol's ability to be cleansed of its stains. Of course, I started seeing swastikas everywhere and in everything. Indeed, it is an ancient symbol whose diaspora was wide. The task I set for myself was to uncover and describe the symbol's various usages, culminating with the Nazi identity and going further, too. To reach that point, I uncovered multiple commercial applications, countless meanings in mythology and superstition, unsettling occult practices whereby the symbol was key and scores and scores of pre-Nazi and pre-Germanic iterations that were as innocent as this Idaho corn palace or this girls club emblem and magazine. And even this American swastika. It was necessary for me to find what other scholars and even occultists had to say about the form, so I found lots of literature. And then I had to correlate it with why the Nazis adopted it this is the ABCs of National Socialism. Then there is an entire genre of post-Nazi applications that had valid and invalid philosophical implications, like this strange scene from a nameless underground film, and this incomprehensible restaurant in Southeast Asia. And the use of the swastika and parody was important. My book on the swastika and my later book, Iron Fists, Branding the 20th Century Totalitarian State, became a form of graduate school education for me. Since I never had formal training, my books became opportunities to teach myself and be taught by others the finer points of research and scholarship. This project also became a branch in a tree of inquiry that in one direction led me to explore other signs and symbols and their meanings. It is true that one thing always leads to another and another. Curiosity grows exponentially, at least in my world. And from my interest in the swastika came other, seemingly disconnected connections. One was the 1939 New York World's Fair, and particularly its centerpiece symbol, the Trilon and Perisphere. The fair was a new dawn in a besieged 20th century and its symbol marked the marriage of commerce and design, industry and progressive thinking. It was not a cult like the swastika, nor exclusionary, but it was mystical in the sense that it represented the future on Earth. When construction began at the 39 World's Fair, it was like a moonscape with futuristic structures emerging everywhere. Once completed, it was a kind of science fiction landscape with practical implications. This is the General Electric Pavilion. And this is the Westinghouse Pavilion at night. Designers were the kings, and a couple of queens, in this Camelot. 
Everything from the lighting stanchions to the walkways were purposely designed. From an historical perspective, the New York World's Fair and the Nazi spectacles came from two sides of the same source. The Germans were responding to the terrible privations of their depression, and they used design to rally the nation under a single banner. Design for them symbolized authority and prosperity under their single leader. The 1939 World's Fair was a similar spectacle, designed to prove that capitalism and democracy were the way of the future. Designers used their talents to create a propagandistic environment designed to lull the populace into a sense of, as it turned out, false security. It promoted automotive progress, chemical energy, and petroleum production, created temples through architecture parlance to the virtues of American ingenuity, power, and supremacy. Some of the futuristic manifestations in architecture, technology, and design were indeed sirens of the world to come. Designers were the white knights of this future. Yet reality was also endemic to the fair. Frankly, it needed cash to operate, and attendance figures did not match up to the grand designs. The city of Oz, visible from the Empire State Building, was just a mirage. Design, no matter how futuristic, wasn't a big enough draw to make ends meet. The fair was only constructed to last two years. What fascinates me is that it was at once a mecca of design and a graveyard. Corporate design was born at the 1939 New York World's Fair, and some of it changed the way we live, but much of it simply bolstered the ills that exist today. The 1939 World's Fair was a hothouse gone public. For me, it led to another branch of design history, the insulated incubator of ideas, how design and designers thought about the future in relative isolation. From the capitalist capital to the idealistic haven, I turned my attention, albeit briefly, to designers of the avant-garde and for their quests for utopia. From the Bauhaus, and this is by Herbert Beyer, to the Russian Revolution and the challenge of creating a new visual language for a new political and economic model. This is For the Voice by El Lizitsky. And to the integration of the various European avant-gardes, especially the unprecedented imagery that was created to express the new order. And ultimately to the ways in which this new order would intersect with real politics and economy. Ultimately, the world's leaders were not designers, but politicians, economists, ideologues all, who despite all the best intentions, led the world to disaster and attempted to rebuild it with ideologies that used design to disastrous results. These branches of investigation became less like a tree and more like a vine twisting in on itself. From the utopia and dystopia of the avant-garde, I returned to modernism through the lens of commercial modernism. There is never a really straight line in history. There are always twists that one least expects. For me, this man, Ernst Elmo Calkins, was the turning point. He was one of the primary shapers of commercial modernism in the United States. He was smitten by the French, particularly the 1925 Paris Exposition of Arts and Industry, which introduced art moderne or art deco to the world. He wrote admiringly about the incredible wares that came together there and lamented about the poor quality of American